Yeah. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks so much for coming out for the geography and planning lecture. We are very fortunate to have with us Mario Molina today. Many of us know Mario from back when he was an App State student. He graduated with his master's in biology in 2003, but as a perfect metaphor for who he really is at heart, he was telling me, just like many of you, he got lost in ranking today. <laughs> and he found himself back in the biology department trying to find geography. So he said, that's really a metaphor for what was going on all those years ago when he was a student here. Now, we have a lot of students who, um, who overlap between the various disciplines represented here in the building, and those collaborations are very valuable. So before coming to App State, Mario got an undergraduate degree in biology at College of the Ozarks in Arkansas. And then after graduating from here, he held a number of jobs with different environmental organizations. He worked for ISV, which stands for International Student Volunteers. Is that right? Yep. Okay. And I reconnected with Mario while he was living in Ecuador during that work, but he was also, as he'll tell you more details later, bouncing around throughout Central and South America and also Australia doing that work. So that was right about the time that Baker and I started taking groups to Ecuador instead of Bolivia. And fortunately, I learned that Mario was living there and he took care of all the logistics. We would have been literally lost, much worse than getting lost in the ranking complex without his help. So he set up transportation and he got us great lodging at great prices at some incredible places. Um, at the Tambopoxi Lodge in particular, right on the flank of uh, Cotopaxi Volcano. And that was probably the best thing that happened. And we followed up on that in subsequent years. He also provided climbing services and taught our students how to ice climb, and more importantly, how to self-arrest. <laughs> Mario set up a new route on Ilaniza Sur, except right here, yeah. while he was there, and furthered his alpine climbing skills. And part of like best known his resume, as they said during that time, he almost learned to surf. <laughs> All right, so um, after that time, he worked at several other organizations, including the Alliance for Climate Education in California, and then became the director of the Climate Reality Leadership Corps and the Climate Reality Project in Boulder in 2013 until 2016. Since then, uh, Mario has been executive director of Protect Our Winters, and you see their logo up at the top. I think many of you know that Powell was established by Jeremy Jones, probably the world's most famous backcountry snowboarder and filmmaker and just an incredible human being who's doing great things to uh, fight against climate change and to help people understand better what can be done about it. So we're really excited to have Mario here today to talk about the work he's doing. And he's also going to talk a little bit about the collaborative work that he's doing with Ron and Dr. Jonathan Sugg on the collaborative project to even more effectively address these issues. So everyone, please welcome Mario. Thank you. One thing that I love about speaking in public, it's like you're attending your own eulogy before you die. <laughs> uh, so yeah, thanks everyone for coming. Thank you for showing up. As Mike was saying, I had a history here at Appalachian. My work when I was here was really focused on the multi-scale interactions of wetland ecosystems. And that led me down several rabbit holes, including geography, geology, and, and mathematics. But what I really liked at the time was that the linearity of the approach that a lot of times we take to problem solving doesn't really work in the real world. And I've been able to transfer a lot of those skills across time in my career. Um, I also asked biology this yesterday, but they didn't have her answer for it. Maybe you guys do. I lost that hat in this building about 20 years ago. If anyone sees it, I'd love to get it back. Um, after I left here, as Mike said, I spent quite a bit of time in Ecuador and in the Andes. And that's where really my passion for high altitude mountaineering uh, started to come into play. But also I started to realize how rapid uh, the rate of glacial recession was particularly in the tropics. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. And not only are the ecological and financial implications great for me, so somebody who really gets a lot of my replenishment from the mountains and mountain environments, it really struck a very personal, a very personal chord. Um, I have been very fortunate in my career to be able to combine my passions for outdoor, outdoor uh, recreation and 
environmental and climate work. Uh, I had the pleasure of serving under former Vice President Ag War for about five years and learning a lot about international policy and international diplomacy from doing that work. But fortunate, unfortunately, most of the work that I did with him required wearing a suit and a tie. So I decided that was not necessarily the best place for me. Uh, however, Protect Our Winter, the opportunity with Protect Our Winters came up, I rapidly, uh, I rapidly embraced it. And it really combines both of my passions, my passion for outdoor recreation and the people that you meet and the interactions that you have in the outdoors with this urgency, uh, urgent sense of mission in terms of addressing climate change. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk through a little bit of the science. I expect everyone in this classroom to already have the basics of the science dialed. So I won't spend a whole lot of time on it. And I also don't want to get called out if I get anything wrong. <laughs> but, um, but if I do, then I want to talk about what are the impacts, uh, implications of the science to mountain environments, and then very specifically to the industry and the community that I represent, which is the outdoor sports community and the outdoor sports industry. What are the economic implications? What are some of the cultural implications? And then before we all go down like that doom and gloom despair uh, rabbit hole, start talking a little bit about what the solutions are. What are the solutions that we have available right now? Uh, what are the solutions that are on the horizon that are incredibly promising for this, uh, for the problem? And then what are some of the actions that we as a society need to take in order to shift towards a clean energy, towards a clean energy future? Uh, and then talk about the approach that we're taking in terms of using geography to really select and target our communications towards um, moving those solutions forward and some of the work that we've done with Appalachian, with Appalachian State. Uh, in that direction. So bear with me here. Here we go. I'm going to try and get, uh, get through all this in the time that we have. Uh, this is just this spring. I am fortunate enough to leave, uh, live just outside of Boulder, Colorado, and this is my backyard. Uh, but I get really concerned anytime that we have really heavy win uh, warming periods in the middle of the winter because that whole thing can slide. Uh, and that will slide in under the wrong conditions. And the more that we have variable winter conditions, the more dangerous that that gets. So I'll talk a little bit more about that in, uh, in a few minutes. But that is, in a nutshell, a little bit about myself. So protect our winters. What we do is we help passionate outdoor enthusiasts protect the places and lifestyles that they love. That is, in one sentence, what we're trying to, what we're trying to achieve. Now, the climate science is clear. There's, I mean, I think very often we hear this debate as to, a, or in the main in news and particularly in certain circles, you hear the debate that's like, oh, the climate science is unsettled. No, it's not. We all know the basics of this solar radiation reaches the Earth's atmosphere, some of the heat escapes, uh, but a lot of it is um, as we increase greenhouse gases, more heat, more heat is trapped. What I think is really uh, noteworthy about this particular image is if we look actually at the thickness of the atmosphere in relationship to the diameter of the Earth. Carl Sagan once said that if we were to actually take an apple and peel the, uh, take the peel of an apple off the apple, that is the equivalent between the, the, Earth, uh, the Earth and the thickness of the atmosphere. Now, sometimes that can be a lot to, uh, a lot to bear. Um, right now, this is where we're at over the last Basically, over the last five years, we've already seen about a 20 uh, parts per million con uh, concentration increase in the atmosphere. This is from the uh, Mauna Loa Observatory. And we know that carbon dioxide and temperature have, been, have had a coupled relationship over the last you know, 800,000 years. When we used to address high school students or uh, middle school students, we used to say they're kind of an item, they, were, they go together. Um, and so that metaphor works, works for them. What we use as a metaphor for the outdoor industry is we say, hey, basically it's the equivalent of wearing an 800 degree fill down jacket in 64 degree weather. Like it makes things really hot. Now, where is that extra down fill coming from? There are basically three, uh, there's multiple sources of emissions, but we can, if we are able to tackle two of them, we actually address about 66% of emissions. And that is talking about electricity generation and transportation. In the United States, those two combined account for about 66% of our emissions. And then we can talk about agriculture and others. But really, solving the energy problem is at the core of how we get to solving the climate, the climate problem. Because then we can decarbonize a lot of other industries and a lot of other sectors of the economy if we're able to figure out how do we decarbonize electricity generation and, trans and transportation. This will become relevant again later. Um, so I just want to 
talk a little bit right now. What we're, this graph, what this graph shows is the number of days that had average temperatures based on a 1951 to 1980 baseline. And we see they have a nice normal distribution curve as you would expect. And you would have that for days that are colder than average, average, and then warmer than average. Now look at what happens as we start moving to 1990 and 2000. Not only do we have a two degree, uh, a two standard deviation shift from the mean in terms of average temperatures, but we see the appearance of what we call extreme, hot, extremely hot days. Basically, from Islamabad to the Pacific Northwest, every year we hear in the news that new records are being broken in terms of local and uh, in terms of local geographies. Um, and then, if we look at that from the 2020 to from 2010 to 2020, those extreme days are actually now covering about one fifth of the Earth's surface. So we're breaking records in one fifth of the Earth's surface on temperature extremes, and we have fewer colder days. Now, this is relevant and has implications across multiple systems, but uh, in his book, uh, Anti-Fragile, Anti Nassim Taleb actually makes the argument that most of civilization systems are actually built to manage risk based on previous patterns. And so this idea that you can, you can predict future patterns from uh, future results from past patterns, that does not work when you have what he calls fat tails. Fat tails are when you have extreme events that are, that are usually infrequent and happen, at the, and happen at, the, at the either end of the distribution, but they have overwhelmingly significant consequences for the system. So to put it another way, it's think about COVID, right? Like COVID was this one black swan event that completely disrupted everything in our, everything in our lives for, uh, for a significant period of time. There was no real way to predict what the next one of those things will be because we can mitigate risk and we can mitigate damage for the things that we know have happened. We can't do it for the things that we don't know will happen or that have very low probability of happening. You might think of it as like 100 year floods, right? We, we are prepared for things that happen on regular cycles. The appearance of these extreme events at the tail ends of the temperature distribution has significant implications for every single system from agriculture to supply chains to, uh, yeah, uh, agriculture to supply chains, to water availability, to water availability, health benefits, et cetera, et cetera, as many of you probably know, just from following, following the news. Uh, as an example, and that is where we transition to mountain environments, think about most of cities in the Andes, particularly Bolivia. The entire population of Bolivia actually depends on glacial runoff for the fresh water supply. Uh, the entire population of La Paz, Bolivia, depends on fresh water runoff for their water supply. There have been, uh, there's been civil unrest multiple times in Bolivia when the government has tried to privatize the water supply. Uh, so water wars, we used to hear about them as being a thing of the future. It's something that is happening or that is happening already. And across the Andes, up and down South America, about 30% of agricultural production depends on glacial and glacial runoff. If we move to the other side of the, we move to the other side of the world and look at Nepal, what you see here down here on the left is this beautiful Sherpa tea house village uh, that is at the base of the, Gokyo, uh, of the Gokyo Glacier. That entire glacier is being held back by a glacial dam. A glacial dam is basically a large body of ice that is holding back the glacier. What happens is as temperatures rise and glacial dams start, ice dams and glacial dams start collapsing, you have the, the significant risk of lahars coming down and wiping off entire villages. And, Unfortunately, because of the thermodynamics of glaciers, the way this works is once you have initial, an initial melt, the rest of the glacier just starts melting at a much more rapid rate. So the consequences are severe, not only for, for systems, but also for, uh, also for localities. And for those of us that love mountain environments, this is something of really, really high concern. Um, now moving to another pole, I like to think of high altitude environments as the third pole of uh, third poles of the earth, but moving to another pole, let's talk about what's happening in the Arctic and then what are the consequences to the North American continent for warming in the Arctic. So over the last two years, we've actually had significant melting in the Arctic to the extent that uh, it was in 2020, I believe, that Arctic sea ice didn't actually, didn't actually freeze. Now, how many of you are familiar with the jet stream? Geography department, I would hope most of you would be biology. I would excuse if you were. Um, all right. 
So the jet stream is a circumpolar current, right? That just goes, that traditionally has just gone around the pole. Now, how many of you remember the first time that you heard about the polar vortex? And it was in the news and everybody was talking about the polar vortex, right? Well, the polar vortex is a direct result of a fluctuation in the jet stream. What's been happening is you can see this temperature anomaly from earlier this year, March 3rd, 2000, uh, 2022. What you can see here is you have much colder than average temperatures across the Midwest and into the Northeast and much warmer than average temperatures from the Arctic all the way across the continental United States. That cold air is the jet stream. And what's happening with the jet stream, it's, it's becoming much wavier. Instead of being a nice circumpolar current, it's becoming this sinuous curve that goes up and down the continent. And that increases not only the variability and unpredictability of precip uh, winter precipitation, with cold fronts, but it also causes for uh, low, uh, high pressure systems to stay in place for much longer because they are blocked by low pressure systems. So this is really changing the entire way that winter uh, that winter works. And for those of us that care about things like the, when do uh, when are resorts going to open? When is the first snow going to come? How stable is the snowpack going to be? And for the mountain communities and the thousands of people that depend on those jobs. This is a significant this is a significant concern. So, uh, what we're seeing is much more variability in the winter season because of the jet stream. Now, how many of you have heard about atmospheric rivers? I love it. About half of you. Basically, until about ten years ago, we used to think that mo most of the moisture in the world, most uh, most of the water in the world moved through our river systems and then evaporation and then precipitation happened again. But we didn't realize how strong current, like how these moisture currents, how concentrated some of these moisture currents are. One of these atmospheric jet streams, the, it's called the Pineapple Express. It basically, uh, I love that name because it comes from Hawaii and it's loaded with moisture and it's carrying about as much moisture as the Mississippi River on, on a good, in a good winter. And all of that moisture comes and slaps up against the Sierras in the, in the Western US. And then it drops that moisture. At about nine to 10,000 feet, 10, yeah, nine to 10,000 feet, that moisture hits the Sierra, the Sierra Nevada. And then if temperatures, when that happens in winter, are 32, 31 degrees or below, it's epic. Like that, all of that moisture falls as snow. If it hits 9,000, 10,000 feet at 34, 35 degrees, it falls as either slush or rain. And so forgive my French, but the difference between an epic day out and an epic season or epic shit is about one degree. Now, these changes actually have uh, serious implications for safety in the backcountry as well. And, and actually for the quality of snow that you will encounter, that you encounter on resorts. So not only do these changes affect the onset of winter, the start of winter, and the, and the end of winter, or how much snow it gets, it affects the quality of the snow. What you see here is a massive, al a massive avalanche. And if what you get earlier, if you, what you get earlier than the, if the snow that you get earlier in the winter doesn't totally freeze, or it, or it starts melting before it's had time to settle, it creates weak layers. And you get weak layers upon weak layer, and if it really affects outdoor recreation. Now you might think like, oh, well, that's a luxury problem to have. For us in Colorado, that problem actually resulted in about 22 deaths last season. Um, because you're seeing an increase of about 30% participation in winter sports, and particularly in backcountry sports. COVID was actually a big driver of these things. And you're having a lot of people going out into the backcountry in what's now in what are now somewhat unpredictable snowpacks. Uh, across different areas, not only in Colorado, but across across the West. And I think even here in North Carolina, you've seen huge variability or a huge change in the quality of the snow that you get even up at Banner, even up at Banner Elk. So I'm gonna take a pause and a, a short break for some good news. Uh, we, we, inter we interrupt this program to actually bring you a little bit of good news. Uh, and the good news is that Really, until recently, we knew that oceans were absorbing about 25% of human cost emissions um, through basically what's called the, at, uh, the atmosphere-ocean inter interactions. Now, it's very, it's, most of the modern research, uh, most of the research that we have right now is starting to point towards an underestimation of how much oceans are actually, uh, how much CO2 
oceans are actually absorbing. And that's because we hadn't actually accounted for the variability of temperature between what's called the cold ocean skin at the very, very top, like the first centimeter on the, on the ocean surface, and you know, to go several meters down. And that variability actually gives the oceans a whole lot more capacity for carbon dioxide uptake. So that's actually really good news. And I like it because it's not often that we get good news coming out of climate science. Um, but it buys us some more time. It does buy us some time, but it doesn't actually make the problem, make the problem go away. Um, so, you know, from large scale impacts, such as increased frequency and intensity of hurricanes to ecosystem damage and ocean ecosystem damage to increased drought. We also have some, uh, some impacts that touch a little bit closer to home. The variability of the snowpack in the back country, the reduction of snowpack for resorts across the country. Uh, we've seen some of America's most iconic landscapes like Yosemite catch on fire. Uh, you, know, you might remember that from last year in California. I think we've got, we've got uh, uh, are you a pine ecologist? Are you a pine ecologist? Basically, yeah. yeah, we've got a pine ecologist. I can tell you all about how pines depend on fire, but what the impacts of fire can be when they're too frequently and too large. Uh, and then we've also had, you know, but we've had impacts in terms of recreation areas being closed, either because of fires or, uh, um, or, or decreased air quality. So what do we do? What is like, what does, what does power do? This is pro skier, Carolyn Gly and Danny Reyes Acosta with Senator Henrik out in, um, out, in uh, out of New Mexico. And basically not only is all this, oh, like, I can already, I can, we understand the argument. It's like, well, woo hoo, you don't get to ski. Boo hoo, you don't get to do this. Boo hoo ha. And that's an absolutely fair, but here's the point. In a way, it's a cannery in a coal mine. If we get to the point where we don't have a winter snowpack, the least of our concerns is going to be whether we can ski or not. And as we are out in the mountains and we're seeing these changes, it's a cannery in a coal mine that tells us just how sensitive some of these systems actually are to the changes that are coming down the line. And how and then what well, the argument that we're trying to make as well is not only how sensitive are these systems, but how sensitive is our economy to those to these impacts. And so outdoor recreation actually accounts for $887 billion of the, uh, of the US economy. How many of you were aware of this? I thought of this, right? Uh, combined, how many of you have spent more than $100 on a jacket, uh, on a winter jacket in the last five years? <laughs> how many of you have spent more than $500 on any kind of outdoor gear in the last five years? <laughs> <laughs> How many of you have spent more than three thousand dollars on outdoor gear in the last two years? <laughs> One, two, still going, still going. All right. Come on. Yeah. So it was about half of the class, half of the classroom, and those of you that are graduating from geography will be spending more than that here pretty soon. Um, <laughs> so you you start getting a sense even in this widely distributed room, outdoor, there's a lot of outdoor spending happening. Now, all of this entire industry actually depends on access to the outside, access to the outdoors and our ability to recreate outdoors responsibly. What we also don't know is that it actually outspend, there's, it's a higher contribution than pharmaceuticals or downstream fossil fuels, so gasoline and other fuels. But we don't hear about it. We hear about the fossil fuel lobby we hear about the NR. We used to hear a lot more about the NRA, but we don't necessarily hear so much about the outdoor industry coming together. And why? It's because, as an industry, the outdoor industry has made climate change a top advocacy priority. And that's a lot of the work that we're trying to do through our influencers and through our work is make sure that this is at the very, very top of the list of the outdoor industry when they're lobbying, either at the state level or at the federal level, or at the federal level. For skiing and snowboarding alone in 2017, we did we published a report that showed that the annual contribution to the economy is about $12 billion and 190,000 jobs. Now this was before COVID drove a 30% increase in participation in outdoor sports recreation over the last couple of years. So that number can only have gone up. Um, but what happens in low snow years is we lose about 10% of those jobs and about 10% of that economic contribution. And in high snow years, the 
positive benefits don't actually make up for the negative benefits of um, and, and bad snow years. So this is this is having a real economic cost to a major industry in the country. Um, and it's not only snow sports or adventure sports. Uh, hunting actually contributes far, hunting and fishing actually contribute far more to that $880 billion than snow sports do. And hunting uh, hunters and fisher uh, and hunters and anglers, we call them hook and bullet, but they don't like it. Uh, so uh, hunters and anglers actually uh, are starting to notice this as well. So, right? Why does it take, what will it take to solve this? What do we need to do? There's three things that we need. We need to deploy the technologies and the financial instruments that we have, and we need to deploy them rapidly and at scale. We need to shift the culture, and we need, and that will, those two things together can drive political will. So let's start with the technology and financial mechanism. We hear wind and solar, wind and solar, wind and solar. Yes, wind and solar. Wind produces, there's enough wind to actually power 40 times the Earth's needs every year. Uh, there's plenty of winds to go around and actually serve our needs. Solar, there's enough solar energy reaching the Earth every day to power to more than serve 100 times our, our energy needs. There's plenty of wind and solar. Now, one of the questions that, um, that we get is, oh yeah, and now an offshore wind. So this was interesting. A lot of the development of wind and solar, and we're gonna talk a little bit more about this, the development of wind and uh, solar doesn't depend on the availability of wind and uh, of the wind and solar resources. It depends on the ability to get that energy online. So right now we have gigawatts of renewable energy projects that are sitting that are not being developed. There is about seven hundred and sixty billion dollars worth of capital that is not being deployed towards the construction of something like this, offshore wind farms. And where, it's, where a lot of this is being held up is that it's being held up in the permitting process. So just yesterday, I picked this up on our way here. The solar farm bid was denied uh, next era down in Catawba County. And it was denied over five people showing up and voicing their concerns because every single large utility scale project that needs to go online in the country depends on either uh, local, so community, like county level or even city level or state approval before it can come online. And then they also need a power purchase agreement. So for example, the Biden administration just opened up offshore leasing for, uh, leasing for offshore wind projects off the coast of North Carolina. But whether or not those projects will actually be developed does not depend on the capital, does not depend on the wind resource, doesn't depend on the viability of the project. It depends on whether A, it will be approved by the Public Utility Commission, and it depends on whether B, Duke Energy will actually agree to buy the power that gets generated. Now, at $32 per megawatt hour compared to 64 from coal, it's a good business deal. It makes sense. The question is, is it viable in terms of distribution and permit? Uh, will it be viable in terms of distribution and permitting? Another question that we get a lot is like, well, what happens when the wind doesn't blow or the sun doesn't shine? Fair enough. But what we're doing is we need to store that energy. And there's a, there's a multiple, there are multiple solutions to the storage problem. And a lot of them will have to be localized. So uh, one of the solutions is actually the same technology that is going into cool cars like the F-150 Lightning that you can't buy right now because there's more demand than there's not the ability to supply is the very same technology that can be used to scale store, uh, utilities for utility scale storage. So when we invest in innovation of American industry, when we invest in innovations and of companies such as Tesla, when we provide incentives for the purchase of electric vehicles, we're also incentivizing the research and development that's going to be necessary to solve the intermittency problem. In addition, batteries are not the only solution to the intermittency problem. There's all kinds of other solutions. And such as like in Utah, you have these massive salt caves that can be filled with water using solar energy during the day and isn't using the kinetic energy of the water storage to actually power uh, the electric, uh, generate electricity uh, at night when you don't have when you don't have that solar power. So the line that I've been, the principle that I've been kind of bouncing around in my head over the last few weeks is the following. And it's, generation and storage solutions are going to have to be localized. 
but distribution. How do we get that energy from where it's being stored or it's being generated to where it needs to be? And that is right now the grid, right? Distribution is going to have to be national and a national solution, not a local solution. And it's going to require federal help because this is what I would like for the grid to look like. Doesn't it, I mean, doesn't that just look modern? Like all the lights are on and the light and, and the lines are nice and neat and they're connecting with each other and things are lighting up, no problem. The reality is our grid probably looks a little bit more like this. Uh, and it's because our grid is really not, it's the largest machine in the world. The United States grid is the largest machine in the world. But it's been pieced together since the 1890s when Edison's, uh, Edison's pupil, Samuel Insel, first went to Chicago and said, okay, we can generate electricity. And with electricity, and people were like, well, what do we do with it? It's like, <laughs> well, uh, you can use it to turn on lights. And it's like, great. So you have lights. And then, then what? It's like, well, Chicago, you can light up this entire street. And that's how Chicago got City of Lights. Chicago was the first city to actually light up its streets. Uh, but then they laid down the wires and then another company said, well, we'll do it over here. And these, we started laying the grid basically on top of each other until it got so complicated that the uh, utilities themselves said, wait a second, we need federal regulation. We need for this to be regulated so we're not competing with each other and putting wires that look like this in every single city. Uh, and that's how you might have heard this or you might hear this in the future. That's how uh, utilities became the only regulated monopoly in the country. So they are a legal monopoly. They have the right to own a territory. Now that a lot of that changed with NEPA in the 1970s, late 1970s, which allowed for renewable energy distribution to come into the grid. So the problem now is we have a grid that looks like this and we need to be able to move electricity across the country and we need high voltage lines to move the electricity from where it's being generated to where it needs to be consumed. That reinvestment requirement is about $50 billion per year. Uh, so the figures that get thrown around are 250 billion to about 400 billion dollars to actually rework our grid. Now, the thing is, we don't have to do it all at once. We can do it 50, 25, 30, 50 billion dollars at a time. So in the infrastructure package that many of you may have heard was proposed to, uh, was proposed to Congress, got voted down, and went back to Congress, and hopefully it'll, it'll pass. There is some investment for grid optimization, but it's just not quite enough. Because you heard me say the number one problem that we have right now to get renewable energy projects online is permitting. The second problem is interconnection. And it's you need to have really high voltage capacity lines in order to dump large amounts of electricity into the grid at a given time. Most of those high voltage capacity lines right now are connected to either natural gas or coal fired power plants. And so most of the renewable energy that's going into the grid right now and the growth of the, in the renewable energy sector is happening by substitution. We are taking coal fired power plants off the market and we're putting renewable energy plants where those interconnection points exist. But guess what? The sun and the wind don't give a darn about where your interconnection points are. They blow where they blow and they shine where they shine. And so if we want to actually maximize the capacity of renewable energy that we have in this country, which is huge, we're gonna to have to start figuring out how do we get high voltage capacity lines to the places where we can generate renewable energy. Uh, and that is really the question of the 21st century for uh, America's energy security. Because whatever we do now will actually lock us in to an infrastructure that will last another 30 to 40 years. We are right now coming towards the end of the cycle of a lot of the infrastructure that got built after World War II and 1960s and 70s. And what we're going to do next is going to really determine not only the fate of America's energy security and energy future, but our contribution to the global problem in terms of reducing uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Well, all of what I'm trying to say is this stuff matters. And a lot of these decisions come down to how many people actually show up at some small hearing in Catawba County to allow or not allow for renewable energy projects to be developed. Um, the real good news. I interrupt this pro normally uh, our, our regular plant programming to get some good news. Uh, some aspirational technologies. So there are things coming online now that we did not think would be possible even five years ago. Right, some of you might have seen in the latest IPCC report that the IPCC is now saying, hey, to meet our target goals, we're going to have to engage in direct carbon capture. 
Direct carbon capture literally means taking uh, atmospheric carbon out of the atmosphere and putting it somewhere else. So you heard me talk a little bit about the oceans and the increased uh, storage capacity of the oceans. There are companies like this one, Ebb Carbon, that have figured out the technologies where they can combine it with existing high water usage plants, such as desalinization plants. Their first model project is going up in San Diego, uh, a desalinization plant in San Diego, or a nuclear thermal reactor coolants, of which there are several, and they use large amounts of, uh, large amounts of salt water. And what they do is they take the seawater, it goes into whatever plant is being used, and then it goes into Ebb Carbon's plant, which is a, uh, proprietary information in terms of exactly how it works, but what it ends up doing is it breaks up the acids and the bases and it drops, it pumps base water back into the ocean, changing the chemistry of that water. And then simply by the chemical, like the chemical imbalance, the ocean then needs to absorb more carbon dioxide to reach carbon, uh, to, to reach uh, its chemical balance. And you can do this at NOSM. So using technology like this at scale, the potential, the, uh, the potential for capture in the oceans is about 10 trillion tons of carbon dioxide. That is more than we need. Obviously, they won't be able to scale to fulfill the full potential, but they can do this at a cost, basically they can do this at a cost of about 40 ton, uh, $40 per ton of carbon dioxide. So obviously you gotta pay for this somehow. Right, and this is where putting a price on carbon and internalizing the externality and making sure that hey, we're no longer allowing for fossil fuel companies to emit endless amounts of uh, carbon dioxide into the atmosphere without a cost. We realize that you know, by some estimates, the social cost of carbon, the impacts of carbon dioxide, are costing us anywhere from 120 to 180 dollars per ton of carbon dioxide. At only 40 dollars, things like this can be fund can be funded simply because uh, by the carbon absorption capacities. And this is one of several technologies that are coming on board. Some of you might have heard um, Alphabet, uh, Alphabet, Meta, and, uh, um, and McKinsey just announced a $950 billion fund to fund projects and technology exactly like this, because they realize not only, they're not only doing it out of the kindness of their hearts or the concern for the environment, they realize that there is actually a market transformation happening and a huge market for carbon right now. So that's some of the solutions then obviously we need the political will. A lot, of these pol a lot of the policies that we've been discussing, like great improvements, approvals, et cetera, require political will at the local, state, and federal level. And so I think this is where all those of us that raise our hands when we say we spend more than $100 uh, on outdoor gear per year come into play. <laughs> Together, we're about 50 million people that recreate outside on a regular basis in the United States. And the reality is that this is the distribution in terms of political affiliation. This idea that this is a partisan issue has been amplified and really monetized and politicized by people who have an interest in keeping it and making it and having it remain a political issue. The challenge is that it hasn't been a political priority. And those two things are very different. We, most of us actually agree, 90%, regardless of party affiliation, agree that climate change is human cost. And most of us actually agree as well that, oh, 70 and 75 percent want to do our part, be better advocates, and actually want to see government action on the on the issue as well. This is where it becomes a geographical problem, because the reality is that there are certain states and certain senators and certain areas in the country where this has been internalized into the culture, and we're moving and we're moving forward. California has had incredibly progressive energy and climate policies now for almost three decades, but we've done we. We've kind of looked at outdoor recreation states across the country, places that have high concentrations of outdoor enthusiasts, and identified four of them right now that have disproportionate influence in what's going to happen in terms of our energy policy moving forward. So people like John Kester in Montana, who is a Democrat, but doesn't necessarily support every policy that we would like him to support, and like a carbon, uh, like a carbon a price on carbon. Uh, Senator Sinema in Arizona, who was one of the main uh, opposition to the, to the infrastructure bill. In Colorado, we actually have now pretty progressive state level legislation that we have to now push the, uh, push the, uh, the administration to implement because there's a difference between good laws have zero net effect on carbon reduction. It's the implementation of good laws uh, in Utah and Nevada. So the work that we've been doing with uh, Jonathan has been really helpful to us if we can go to that map 
has been really helpful to us in really honing in. Yeah, that's perfect. Yeah. Let's go zoom in one more. So what we asked Jonathan to do is, listen, this is not only a climate problem, this is a democracy problem. Why is it a democracy problem? Because if there's agreement on what we should be doing across party ideologies, but it's not becoming a priority, what's going on that we can't get this moving? And the reality is that we don't have enough participation. We don't have enough people showing up to the polls in places that matter, regardless of party affiliation, and then asking their elected representatives to make this a top legislative priority. So what we've done is we've identified different counties within congressional districts and looked at what their turnout rates have been and identified every single county in which the turnout, uh, the turnout for an election has been lower than average and where we are or, or low or we think that we can increase voter turnout and then we've also identified which of those legislators have been either climate advocates or climate not advocates and have won or lost by less than three uh, less than three percent of the margin of the vote and our goal in the next over the next over the two to four years is going to be to mobilize every single one of these uh, little blocks these, these are either ski areas climbing gyms outdoor shops or universities and so our goal is to mobilize about 150 of our elite athletes uh, and identify where do we have corporate partners in those states to mobilize for voter registration and get out the vote efforts over the course of the next two elections. And we could not have done that work without having a cooperation of uh, Jonathan, the geography department in terms of creating these maps and helping us identify these areas. So that's my shameless plug for geography. <laughs> Uh, so next it's cultural change you know everybody's like oh our, you know, our elected leaders the reality is our elected leaders are our elected followers they actually very much follow the, the will of people and so um or the overall sense of people so this is culture change so like, we need to change the way that we think about climate change or we need to think the way that we think about about energy and the way that we do it is by changing the, main, the changing the narrative, not only in the mainstream media, but across our networks of influence. So all of us have a network of influence. Um, some of us have fewer followers on Instagram. Some of you have more. Uh, some of us have uh, are more active, or some of us aren't. But basically, utilizing our personal networks of influence utilizing our institutional networks of influence and then pushing out true information and true science and true solutions to counteract some of the narrative that you that you're running into because we are really in a battle on misinformation i was reading an article just this morning where there's people opposing wind farms uh, in ohio because they think they have seen they saw some study on facebook that said that wind farms caused increased rates of cancer birth in portuguese horses and that that could probably translate to human babies. <laughs> I kid you not, right? Uh, but a lot of these networks are actually being funded. This is not just organically happening. And so we have the solutions, and yet we have these blocks that we keep running into over and over and over. Why? Well, it's the usual suspects. The people that have blocked this for the last 40 years. And that ranges from politicians who have deep ties to the fossil fuel industry uh, and who bring a snowball to the floor of Congress to try and prove that climate change isn't real, to, uh, to people who make an economic, economic arguments, to denial of the role that CO2 plays, uh, that connect to the financial institutions that have a vested interest in continuing to fund new fossil fuel development, even though the International Energy Agency, which is not an environmental group, has said we really can't develop any more large-scale fossil fuel projects and uh to disinformation campaigns and really you know fossil fuel industry like exxon mobil and chevron those of you that have that don't know this for years how many of you how many of you have ever encountered this ethical dilemma have you felt like i really want to talk more about climate i really want to do more for climate but i drive a car i'd like to buy my stuff uh, i really don't want to go vegan or vegetarian and so i don't feel like i can do this without feeling like a hypocrite hands up okay no half hands either full hand or no hand up <laughs> um yeah there you go so about two-thirds of you 
This is a result of a very, very effective campaign that's been well documented and researched by the fossil fuel industry to transfer responsibility from their activities to the public. The idea of a carbon footprint and car the first carbon calculator was actually developed and brought to market by, uh, by ExxonMobil. Uh, of all these questions, why? Because if they can get us to feel responsible and guilty about it and not act on it or speak out about it, then it leaves them off the hook. But the reality, and we have, I have the same conversation with corporations, a lot of times brands that we work with, uh, Burton, Skullcandy, uh, Bemis, a lot of the major companies in the outdoor or outdoor adjacent industry have come to us and said, listen, we, we want to do this, but we're not willing to step out because we haven't looked at our supply chain. We, we're not willing to step out. We agree with you. We'll give you money, but we can't speak out on this because our customers will look at our supply chain or our products. This has been a very effective campaign, but the reality is that there are 20 companies in the world that are responsible for 50% of greenhouse gas emissions over the course of the last 80 years. And there's about 50 companies that are responsible for 80% of all greenhouse gas emissions over the course of the last 80 years. Simply by existing and living in the United States, we consume about 22 tons of carbon dioxide on average, as compared to five or six in Denmark or two in India per person. Now, we could all go, we should, we should all live examined lives, but that's an ethical question. Right, like the choices that we make in our own life and how we choose to live our lives in order for them to reflect our values, those are ethical questions that we need to struggle with and answer for ourselves. But that does not get the companies off the hook that have been building, designing, financing, and forcing upon us systems and, or, and now refuse to change the systems that lock us in to the fact that if we want to turn on our electricity in most of the country, 60% of it is generated by coal. When we have all the solutions that we just talked about at hand, if only we will remove the blocks in order to deploy them at scale. What this means for them is a massive, significant, in the order of $150 trillion of the global economy, shift in capital. So you can understand why they're worried about it. Uh, and that's why we get things like you know, this. So uh, the investment capital. That's why we get these challenges with permitting. A lot of these grassroots efforts are not so grassroots. A lot of these grassroots efforts have been geographically targeted to specific regions where you want to develop large scale util utility scale projects. And it boils down to like Aries, uh, this quote is from uh, Stephen Porto at, uh, at Aries. Aries is a company, how many of you have heard of BlackRock? Uh, or, uh, yeah, BlackRock investment, like large investment fund, multi-billion dollars. Uh, BlackRock and Aries both have about $200, $250 billion in frozen capital that is earmarked for renewable energy investment that can't be deployed because we can't get projects permitted. Uh, so this is what we think we need to do. Long truth that the one thing that's perfect when a is actually built on is the land. This land. This land. This land. For some of us, our ancestors have been here forever. Others arrived centuries ago. Others did not choose to come here at all. But despite our different habits, we all converged here on this land. You see, the land is our common ground. We cannot continue to allow our seasons to shrink, our rivers to be polluted, our skies to warm, and our forests to burn. It's time to protect the places you love from the effects of climate change. So, uh, in summary, can we go to the next slide? Thank you. Uh, we're, we're there. We, we made it. Um, in summary, we need to transition our cultural values so that America's energy security and our future becomes an American value. We need to uh, rapidly deploy the technology that we have available, and we need to make sure that climate becomes a top policy priority. 
for our lawmakers at all levels of government. Thank you. Appreciate your attention. We have time for questions. We do. If you will please unmute yourselves and turn on your camera. <laughs> How much of House effort is towards direct lobbying with lawmakers or with like the more local scale of jurisdictions or municipalities? Yeah, thank you. So I need to make a distinction um, that I didn't get into. It's we actually, as a 501c3, we, we have a limit on how much we can actually lobby and it's about 10% of our overall budget. Um, but we also have a sister organization, which is called POW AF, uh, Action Fund, uh, which, is, uh, which is a 501c4, and that, actually, and that actually allows us to increase our lobbying efforts. So it will go up and down depending on what bills are in front of Congress or not versus uh, an election versus non-election uh, years. And then a lot of the work that we're doing right now is what's called constituency building. And it's basically trying to educate what we call the outdoor state, you know, as many of these 50 million people as possible on what the issues are. And I was just talking to Jonathan actually about the next project that uh, I want to be looking at is where are, we look, where are we facing permitting issues? And where are we facing grassroots opposition to permitting issues? And how do we mobilize outdoor enthusiasts to those areas? Because when, when you have decisions being made by five people who present a convincing argument, to a county commissioner uh, panel that doesn't have background or expertise in energy, it's very easy to lose those battles because they're scared to make the wrong move. Uh, so we do need we need more of that grassroots support. My question has to do with the maximum fund. Um, so I actually have a question about the maximum fund. And I just wanted to know. Oh, thanks. <laughs> 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 There's a lot of voters, especially in the rural areas of our state, that have a they have a really strong say in what goes on in their own local elections, but they might not be as informed about these decisions as they could be. Where should we be pulling people to go to get that information or just put in the right direction? Yeah, that's that's a great question. So this the answer might be a little more complicated. Um, we need to craft messages that resonate with people based on their values and their life experience. And so not, for example, Powell's message may not resonate necessarily with you know, someone who doesn't really care about outdoor sports. So I wouldn't tell you this in the foul. Uh, I think we need to find places that work up in the air. There are organizations, there are many organizations that are working with what we call constituency groups. Uh, and there's like, if it's farmers, there's a climate, like there's a climate farmers organization. And they talk not necessarily in terms of climate change and energy transition, they talk in terms of protecting agricultural sustainability, agricultural sustainability for the long term. We're just talking about Tribes Unlimited, for example. They talk about protecting the environment. So this, that's a long non-answer to your question. Uh, let me try to be a little more succinct is, it requires a little bit of effort in finding out what do these people care about? I mean, what is the messaging that will actually resonate with that group that you're trying to talk to? And it doesn't take like, 10 minutes in Google to get those You type in like farming, climate change, out of it. Does that help? Yeah, that's Sorry. Perfect. Thank you. I'm just going to ask about how, okay, so you talked about how the outdoor sports industry has. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> cool, I'm sorry to see that. <laughs> Um, all this money, whereas the fossil fuel industry has less. So I guess my question is, why does the fossil fuel industry have so much more like lobbying power? Yeah, thank you. Um, two things. One is a, a small, just a small nuance to that graphic. And if, if you notice, and I tried to make it clear when I said uh, I was talking about downstream, um, and it said gasoline and fuels. So we're not talking about the fossil fuel industry as a whole. Uh, we're talking about like gasoline stations, uh, propane pellets, like basically consumer, like con consumer customer facing part of the industry. Like as a whole, the fossil fuel industry definitely has much more money uh, than we do. 
But what do they, what do you buy with, what do you buy with all that money when it comes to political power? Your mansion. <laughs> 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 what do those politicians use that money for? More power? How do they get that power? How do they get elected? Voters. Voters. <laughs> Voters. Most campaign contributions actually go towards TV ads, uh, social media ads. They, you know, I think in the last election, um the oh, what was it really contested like that uh, what's it like contested central i don't know it was a state it was out here like right, in northeast uh, east somewhere where the campaign cost was a billion dollars for a senatorial campaign and 80 percent of that money is going towards influence influencing public opinion on ads issue ads social media etc etc and all of that is to get votes uh, and so ultimately, what fossil fuel industry is trying to buy, they're trying to buy us. They're trying to buy our votes that we will support, we will care about other issues more than climate or energy and energy transition, or that we'll support whatever the issues. So politics is newsflash. Politics is a really dirty game. Uh, look, politics is a really dirty game. And I think what we need to remember is we are fortunate and blessed to still live in a country where our votes matter. Um, and not only our votes during presidential elections, but our votes during local elections, our votes at public and civic engagement still works. Um, and but it's being eroded. Uh, and it's a very concerted effort to erode it. So that's my very, very long-winded answer to your question. What we need is we need to mobilize more people who will engage civically with this as a problem. What's one of your favorite memories from participating in the operation space? Whoa, that's a tough one. <laughs> I think maybe not necessarily an individual memory, but the characteristics of the memory that I really care about are those moments where you feel like you're going to have to change your underwear within like five minutes. <laughs> and then at the same time, you're looking at someone that's in the same situation and as committed to it as you are, and that's what helps you not care about it. Uh, but it is, it's, it's the bond that I've been able to make with some incredibly amazing people. And what I noticed is that the better that you are, the more humble that people are, uh, because they realize that it's nothing, nothing given, it can change in a second. Um, so for me, that's Personally, part of it. Mike, I mean, I'd ask you a question. What's, what, what is it? You see, you know, I, I, well, I struggle to answer that question. It's part of adrenaline. That, you know, we had this conversation with the class this morning, a joint uh, class of mathematics and communication. And when you were answering, I was struggling as to how I would answer what was that. Now. So, the part just the real life. But, you know, we all appreciate just being outside. But at this point in my life, I'm still just being outside. Just it's complicated. Yeah. So we have time for one more question, but there's a lot more swag. And Dr. Schroeder is really enjoying being <laughs> <laughs> Last question we are going to have the reception upstairs, and there are cupcakes being provided by Dr. Banco. So come upstairs and. You didn't tell me about the cupcakes. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll have one more question that Mario will select. Um, and then please come upstairs and talk to Mario. I'll find out more individually. Mario, this is a question that will benefit all the students here. Um, how do, I'm looking at your website right now, and I see great diversity in your employees. What are the things you look for in terms of hiring people when you hire them? Yeah, uh, yeah, that's a great question. It's um, Character. To be honest with you, I I, I try and say the what is the character of a person more so than the resume. Uh, but then it's are you genuine and genuinely passionate about this issue? Uh, number one. Number two is do you like do you have evidence of being a hard worker? Um, and then number three is what's like is this going to be good for you? Like 
is, is your career path you know, aligned with the opportunity that we are able that we are able to offer? Um, and what I've seen is at least at our organization, you know, surprise, surprise, we're a bunch of like tight days. Um, and what I've seen at our organization is it's people who are hungry, like people who are not ready to just settle down and cruise in their jobs, but who want to learn more, want to do more, want to grow. Are the people that have done best uh, at Pow? So when I joined Pow in 2017, we were uh, I was employee number five, and we're now considered you know, a small, mid-sized organization. In the last four years, we've had 22 people, uh, and we're now at 27. And I'm really happy to say that we've only had two people leave the organization in the last four years. Uh, but I think it's that combination of traits. I mean, there's a certain self-selection that happens. By the people that are attracted to that intersection of our worst stories, you know, climate and ethics. Before we thank Mario, we want to let you know there's a reason there are all those stickers up front. Please grab one on your way out and please do join us upstairs for cupcakes and to convince Dr. Jordan that you're serving some great ski socks. Right. Thank you very much.